Thanks. All right, I have a two-part question. It's an academic setting, so I have to ask. Someone has to ask a two-part question. Um, so, Director Ray, historians have documented the FBI's troubled historical relationship with civil rights activists and minority communities, for example, surveillance campaigns against black activists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X in the 1960s and Arab American communities post 9-11. And students uh, were asking, does this history still affect the FBI's relationship to minority communities in the present? And what has the agency done to address that legacy of distrust? That's part one. Um, part two is, uh, are there ways in which that history has informed the FBI's efforts to balance in the contemporary moment the deterrence for example, of cybercrime on critical infrastructure to balance that against potential harms to public trust that can come from large-scale data surveillance? Um, and if so, you know, what mechanisms are at place in order to try to balance uh, that relationship? Well, let me, let me take your questions in reverse order, if, if I can. Uh, so on the, uh, the cyber part of your question, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to make something pretty clear. We are not, and we don't engage in large-scale monitoring on companies' networks and infrastructure or university. You know, that's that's not what we do. There are people who think, and I hear from them sometimes. You know, and a lot of thoughtful people who think we should be able to do that, but we don't, and we can't. So we may not actually know, in the cyber context, that somebody's been victimized, unless they come forward. And so the reason why it's important for me to be able to answer that part of your question is we need people <laughs> to come forward because otherwise we may actually not know about the cyber attack that occurs. There is now legislation that's passed that's going to improve the reporting of cyber activity, which, which will help. There are times when we're following a bad guy, like a Russian hacker, for example, and then we find them on some university or company's network and they didn't know about it, and then we're coming to tell them, hey, guess what? Guess who's in your system? Uh, but we're not. The, the, the notion that we're engaged in sort of large-scale data surveillance, you know, mass uh, gobbling up of data in the cyber arena is, is largely overblown. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to address that, not just because of the accuracy of the, the concern, but more importantly because if people think well, we've got all that information anyways, we can just sit back and let the FBI tell us when they've, we've been hit, then we've got a real problem. So the other part of your question uh, involving Dr. King and some of the other uh, mistakes that we've made over the years. You know, the FBI is a gigantic organization. It's been around for 114 years. Uh, and like any giant organization that's been around for that long, we've made mistakes. And we've made some doozies of mistakes. That's a technical term. But, uh, <laughs> but what I think what distinguishes the most high-performing organizations in the world is not whether they've made mistakes or not, because I would argue any organization that big that's been around for that long has made mistakes. It's what we learn from those mistakes. Uh, and I'm actually very proud of things that the FBI has learned from some of its mistakes over the years. So let's take the Dr. King example in particular. Uh, we now have, you know, I mentioned earlier how I'm having all agents and analysts, you know, in their training go to the 9-11 Memorial. Well, what I didn't mention is there are two other visits that they make as well, each for different purpose. They visit the Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C., and they get to see what happens when law enforcement essentially fails to protect its people. Uh, and they visit the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial, the monument. And there's a whole class that's taught around the Dr. King Memorial that talks about specifically what the FBI did wrong under then Director Hoover and Assistant Attorney General Bobby Kennedy at the time, where they signed off on a wiretap with almost nothing. And if you compare that to what we do now, you know, where the scores of eyes, the pages and pages of detail and rigor that get built into it, uh, it it's, a, it's like night and day by comparison. Uh, but the whole class is an opportunity not just to focus on the importance of rigor and objectivity and not letting our biases affect our work. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to have very healthy discussions about things like race, uh, about 
uh, about bias, about avoiding even the appearance of bias and things like that. So that's part of it. We also uh, have a much more robust, conscious part of our strategy that's focused on community outreach. So every FBI field office has a dedicated community outreach specialist whose sole job is to try to engage with uh, groups in the community. Um, we also have similar versions at the headquarters level with the national civil rights organizations and advo major advocacy groups and things like that. Uh, and are, we're very proud of some of the partnerships we've built both locally all over the country and nationally in that regard. Um, and then diversity is an important part of it. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that the FBI is more diverse at every grade level today than it was four years ago when I started. Uh, not, not where we need to be. I don't want to uh, mislead anybody in that regard, but we've made significant strides and we're going to keep making them. I think all of that is part of the learning from uh, the mistakes of the past.